Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the universe is very large. <clears throat> uh, it's been around for 13.5 billion years. It's about 95.5 billion years large. It consists of stars and galaxies, clusters of galaxies and quasars. So I'm going to tell you today about how we know that the universe is large and how do we measure distances to all these objects. And for that, we need to climb the cosmic distance ladder, which I wish to do today. Right, so this is a ladder, and each rung of the ladder represents one step towards the edge of the universe. So the first step is to find distance to the nearest stars, which we do using parallax, so which is the theme of uh, this afternoon session. The second step is to stars which are further away using CFID and which are known as CFID variables. Then we come to the galaxies, and then we come to galaxies which are much further away. And then um, what are the distances to these objects? Now, that is measured in parsec. So what's a parsec? A parsec is 3.26 light years. And how much is a light year? It is the distance traveled by light in one year, which is uh, about 9 trillion kilometers. Right, so we start with stars which are just 100 parsec away, just our backyard 300 light years away. And then when we go up to the top of the ladder, we are at 4,000 megaparsec. That is an unimaginably large distance, but there is much further to get, which I will show you that we can't. Right, so then what is this? This is our own Milky Way galaxy taken from the inside. It consists of about 100 billion stars, that is 10 to the 11 stars. So if I looked at it from the top, the first view was the edge-on view, but if we could look at it from the top, which we can't, then you'd see it as a nice circle with a disc and a bulge and a bar and spiral arms. Now, in this picture, which are taken with the Hubble Deep Field, it's called the Ultra Deep Field, every object that you see, every dot that you see, uh, is a galaxy. So each dot contains 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 stars, you can imagine how many planets are there and how many civilizations. I mean, Star Wars is nothing compared to this. <laughs> right, so now this is a microscopic part of the sky. And uh, when you take all the galaxies all over, then you know how many there are. And that is what we have to deal with. Right, so now what is parallax? Now, you'll hear about that from many speakers this afternoon. But uh, as pa parallax means an apparent motion for me of an object when I look at it from different directions. So, supposing I'm sitting in a train, I look out of the window, and I see the trees going by very fast, but objects which are further away, the towns and the villages and the mountains very distant, they don't seem to move at all. And why is that? Because I first look at a tree from one side, then very quickly from the other side, so it seems to be passing by. Now, astronomers make use of this to measure distances to the stars. How do we do that? Now imagine the sky, the very faint stars, then there are not so faint stars, and then there's a bright star which is nearby. Supposing I draw an immense triangle, then first I'm at point A, and then I look at the star with my telescope, then I go to point B and look at the star with my telescope. And then I get the parallax angle which is drawn there, and the distance is from the middle of the line AB to the star. And what is that distance given by? It is given by the length of OA, divided by the angle, as simple as that. But how do I draw this triangle in the sky? And for that, I depend upon my own platform, Mother Earth, which is moving in space. So here you see <coughs> a picture of the Earth at one point. I look at a star using my telescope. Then I just go to sleep for six months, get up, and then the Earth is at the other side. And then I look at it again. So I got this triangle, I got the parallax, I got the distance. So who did this first? It was done uh, for a star called 61 Cygni, and then the distance was 3.8 parsec, and it was done by Bessel in 1838, quite long time ago. But why were the ancients not able to do it? The ancients said, because we don't measure parallax, there's no parallax, the Earth is not moving. But that's not true. It is just that they did not have the instruments to make the accurate measurements which are necessary. So now we have got the parallax for a thousand stars of up to about a hundred parsec, which is again our backyard. How do we move further? The problem with going further is the fact that 
the atmosphere blurs the images of stars. So I can't measure accurately the distances at the, their positions in the sky, and therefore I can't get the parallax. So how do we beat that? We just get onto a satellite. So here's the satellite, which is called Gaia, which was launched in 2013, and uh, which is going around. Going around what? Not the Earth like our communication satellites do, uh, but it is going around a very special point, which is known as L2. The second Lagrangian point, which you see, I'm sorry, the second Lagrangian point, which you see there, and this satellite goes around it, um, and uh, then it observes stars, the star fields very, very accurately, and get parallaxes very accurately. And that takes us much further, to about 30,000 light years. But you see that the further you go, the smaller is the angle, and not even something which is as uh, technologically advanced as Gaia can measure it. And we need something else. And that's something we also chanced upon. <coughs> um, and that's called um, a C-feed variable. So what's that? It's a completely different concept. So you see that here is the constellation of uh, Cepheus. And there you'll see a yellow letter called delta. So the delta Cepheus, a star there. And it was discovered again very long ago in the 18th century that the star is variable, which means that the intensity of the star keeps increasing and decreasing. This happens to many stars for many different reasons. It could be because of one star eclipsing another star, or it could be just because the star becomes bigger and smaller. Now, the thing about Cepheid variables is that they've got a very specific pattern of variation. So they go up and down. This particular variable, um, it has a period of five days, eight hours, and 48 minutes. But you can have a whole range of periods. So as astronomers survey the sky, they find many objects which are variable. And those which show a pattern like this um, are the Cepheid variables. And why are they so important? Because of the Cepheid period luminosity relation. So don't worry about the details of it. But plotted on the horizontal axis is the period of a variable. And plotted on the vertical axis is the amount of energy that it emits per second, which is the luminosity. Right. So now you'll see that each point represents a Cepheid variable there, and they lie along a straight line. So which means that if I find a new Cepheid, and I know the period which can be measured, then I immediately know its luminosity. And if I know its luminosity, I combine that with the brightness that I measure from the Earth, and with a simple relation, get the distance. And so who did all this? It was Henrietta Leavitt, who did it in 1900. Uh, between 1908 and 1912. She worked in Harvard with a large group of women who were um, called computers. They were called computers because they computed all day, and then they classified thousands and hundreds of thousands of stars into their types, and did all kinds of investigations. This thing was incredibly important, because it has taken you from <coughs> a short distance that we could measure to a much bigger distance. I'll tell you in a moment how important that was. She was recommended for the Nobel Prize. But in those days, first of all, Nobel Prizes were not given to astronomy. Second, women were not particularly welcome in astronomy, except that when they were doing as computers. <laughs> so you see that um, today she would have definitely made it. And now I will tell you how Cepheid variables take us much further, distance to the galaxies. So here is a, uh, the nearest big galaxy to us, which is known as the Andromeda Nebula. Why nebula? Because it's a very uh, diffuse object. Um, during the Indo-Pak War, I have seen this object with very small binoculars from the lawns of TIFR. Okay, but um, with the telescope, you get a magnificent view with the photograph. And then, um, but until 1920 or so, people did not know whether this is an object inside our galaxy or outside our galaxy. There were major debates about that. So how do we settle a question like this? You could go on philosophizing endlessly. OK, and then how many angels dance on the tip of a needle? Right? But otherwise, you take a practical point of view and say that I want to measure the distance to this object. And that, was, that stupendous task was achieved by Edwin Hubble, who is one of the great astronomers of the previous century. So he worked 
for a very long time on galaxies, did very many important things. Now, look at the observation of uh, the Andromeda Nebula that he did. You see this small little square here, which has been magnified. And then there are literally hundreds of thousands of stars here. And Hubble did the incredible thing of establishing that this little dot that you see here is actually a variable star. And you see here, um, the, um, <coughs> the original photograph by Hubble, where he says variable with an exclamation mark, right? So uh, this turned out to be a CFIT variable. Therefore, you know it's period, and then it's given there, and then uh, you know it's distance. And that distance, uh, Hubble measured to be 1.5 million light years. And what is the extent of our galaxy? It's 100,000 light years. So we should mean that this object is nowhere inside our galaxy. It is just plain outside, okay, which established that the universe must be filled with galaxies. So you see that the measurement of distance, just getting up of, onto a further rung of the cosmic distance ladder, just see how, what an important new thought it had generated. But that was not the end of the story. That was just the beginning. You see that these are all galaxies. And Sleifer, in 1912, before Hubble's time, actually measured, um, looked at the spectrums of the galaxy. Each spectrum has got certain characteristic lines. When compared with the, such similar lines on the Earth in our laboratories, it is found that the spectrum is red shifted. What do you mean by that? That every feature in the spectrum is a little bit redder. The wavelength of every feature has increased. And why does that happen? There's a very simple reason, and it is known as the Doppler effect. So if you see a locomotive coming to you from the back with a horn or the whistle on, and then locomotive passes by, you see a significant change in the pitch. That is because when it is approaching you, the wavelength has gone down, goes down. When receding, the wavelength goes up. And the same is the story with light. Because these galaxies are, these galaxies, they are reddened, which means that the wavelength has increased, which means that they are receding from us. So that was a tremendous discovery. And then uh, Hubble went further and made a plot of the velocity of recession against the distance. So you see that you can measure the distance to only a small number of galaxies, but you can measure the velocities to hundreds and thousands and millions of galaxies. So Hubble had only a handful because you're working with the older technology. And then he got this straight line. So what does it tell you? take a new galaxy, and then measure the redshift, which is e very easy to do. Uh, and then you'll get the velocity, and therefore you get the distance because of this plot. Right, so um, there's a sideline to the story. This is known as the Hubble Law. But last year, the International Astronomical Union decided to call it the hubble lemaitre Law. And that is because there was this very elegant astronomer who was a Catholic priest who worked in the Vatican Observatory who had discovered all this independently. He had discovered what is now called the Hubble Law independently. So last year, a conscious decision was taken to call it the hubble lemaitre Law. Now, the galaxies are all moving away from us, but we are not special. So if you sit on any galaxy, you will see all galaxies are moving away from you. And what does this mean? That the universe is expanding. So you see that in the 1920s, we had not established whether a galaxy is a diffuse cloud inside our galaxy or outside. And in the 1930s, we are beginning to talk about the expansion of the universe. And that was the time Einstein's general relativity had been invented. And so we, the new field of relativistic cosmology came into being, and it had a connection with observations. Now look at this object. It is not like an elegant spiral. It is not an elliptic. It's just a diffuse gas, but it is a galaxy. And how far away is this galaxy? The redshift is so far, so high, that it should be moving at 11 times the speed of light. Is that possible? No. Because Einstein has told us that nothing can move faster than light. So how do we explain this? Was Einstein wrong? No. He was doubly right. Because first he said that nothing can move faster than light. And then in the general theory of relativity, he said that space-time is curved. And if space-time is curved, the simple interpretation that Hubble and Lemaitre put on it is no longer tenable. The maths becomes more complex. But still, redshift remains a measure of the distance and which takes us quite far. The last rung of the ladder, which I'm going to talk about today, is a supernova. A supernova 
when you have got a very large star, many, many times more massive than the sun, when it finishes its uh, evolution, it explodes because the interior of the star collapses and forms what is known as a neutron star. It is made up of neutrons. It is incredibly dense. It is only 10 kilometers in radius. And then uh, the outer layers of the star are thrown out in a supernova explosion. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen an image of the Crab Nebula, which was first seen by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD. This is a different kind of supernova. Because when the stars are not sufficiently massive, they don't form a neutron star at the end of the evolution. They form what is called a white dwarf. And a white dwarf um, is made up of electrons. I mean, it's the electrons which provide the pressure for the dwarf. And then white dwarfs have a mass which is less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And in fact, Subramanam Chandrasekhar proved um, that there can be no white dwarf with a mass greater than 1.4 solar masses because it can no longer be supported by the pressure and it collapses. So here you start with a white dwarf, which is below 1.4 solar masses, and add a little bit of matter to it. This matter is taken from a companion. It's attracted by the white dwarf, falls onto the white dwarf. It could collapse and form a neutron star, but what is more likely to happen that it ends its life in a great conflagration without leaving anything inside, and that is known as a supernova type 1a. And all supernovae type 1a have exactly the same luminosity, and therefore they act as distance indicators. And in fact, it is using this supernova, this indicator that it has been established that our universe uh, <coughs> is not only expanding, but the speed of expansion is increasing. It is becoming accelerated, accelerated all the time. What causes the acceleration? Dark energy. So we have come to the end of the story. And uh, <coughs> we started with parallax, went to see its fundamental plane, which I didn't explain, supernovae, and so on, and coming to the edge of the universe. We have climbed the cosmic distance ladder. And then, uh, but how much have we reached the end of the observable universe? No. We are at about 4,000, uh, 12,000 light years, but the universe is 93 billion light years in size. So are we ever going to get there? No. We are never, ever going to get to the edge of the universe. And why is that? I'm sure you'd like to know, but it's a story for a different time. Thank you very much.